and co-founder and CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang. I love you too. <laughs> I love you guys. Hello, Austin. It's great to be here. I can't, I can't, imagine, I can't imagine a better place to hold this event than the premier, premier dream hack in North America. This is the largest digital festival, as you guys know, in the world. Started in Sweden. This is a place where gamers, digital artists, and people who just love computer get together. We got an amazing show for you guys today, and so let's get started. We've dedicated almost 25 years of NVIDIA to building computing technologies for the world's most demanding computer users. You guys know who they are. <laughs> Digital artists, designers, scientists, gamers, and dream hackers. And dream hackers. You know that, that video games, computer games, started in our generation. And it was made possible by computer technology. The computer technology of microprocessors and mass ROMs made it possible for the Atari consoles to come along. In the 80s, two fundamental technologies made it possible for the PlayStations to be created. First is custom chip design called ASICs, and the second is CD-ROMs. In the 90s, in Windows, with Windows 98 and Direct3D, it made it possible for us to start the PC gaming revolution that we know today. But what makes the PC gaming platform so special is that it's also open. So that technologies can come in and out of this platform, so that hackers, designers, engineers can continue to advance this platform, making it better and better all the time. Today, PC gaming is much, much more than gaming. You guys know that all kinds of, for, uh, all kinds of formats have come in and, uh, and gone, but yet the PC platform is evolving and thriving. All kinds of new types of games, whether it's RTS or RPG or first-person shooters, the fact of the matter is gaming is more than gaming, even. It's now a sport. It's much bigger than a sport. It's a spectator sport. 300 million people around the world enjoy esports today as spectators. And also, because of the amazing technology of gaming, it is now also an artistic medium. Amazing engines like UE4 make it possible for people to create their stories and create shorts and amazing movies using video game technology. Video game technology, PC gaming, has really, really thrived, and it's made it possible to enable all of these different ways to enjoy PC games. And now, of course, there's also VR. We've dedicated ourselves to advancing this platform. And today, we have some really, really groundbreaking stuff we want to show you. Several thousand engineers, several thousand engineers worked in the last several years to make today possible. It is really amazing what they've done. Today, I want to talk about four things. Four fantastic things. Four fantastic things. The first is a new art form. I also want to talk to you about a new sound. A new king. A new king. And something really, really important. Something really, really important for the future of graphics a brand new technology that you guys have never heard of before. A brand new technology. Really exciting new technology. So let's get started. You know, video game technology, as I mentioned, has evolved imme immensely. Because of the GPU and because of programmable shading, video games today are an interactive art form. And artists from all over the world are enjoying are enjoy in-game photography as this new art form. Duncan Harris, Dead End Thrills, Joshua Taylor, Leonardo Sang from Brazil, James Pollock. Each one of them arduously find the perfect moment in a video game, positions their camera just perfectly, waits for the perfect lighting, and captures that amazing moment. And what you get 
is this amazing, amazing palette. What you get is this amazing art form. The work that they've done is really, really quite amazing. I'm so touched by it. We decided that we would make this technology possible for everybody to be able to do. For many of them, they have access to even, even uh, custom builds of video games so that they can control the camera motion. For us, it's really impossible. So ladies and gentlemen, today, we're introducing the world's first in-game 3D camera system. We call it Ansel. Ansel has several features. The first feature, of course, and it's completely built into the driver. It's an SDK that's plugged into uh, the games. The first feature is free camera. No longer are you constrained to just the path that you have to follow by the game. You can now have free camera motion. The second, as in all great cameras, you have effects. You can cutterize. You could change the tonality, change the mood, even vignettes, all kinds of special effects. You can even dump out the EXR, 16-bit floating point of the frame buffer, so they can ingest it into Photoshop and do all kinds of amazing special effects. But you know, you know that a great picture has far, far higher resolution than what you see on a monitor. And so we can allow you now to render to 32 times higher resolution than your monitor, uh, than what you see on a monitor. So 4K, a 1,000 times higher resolution than 4K. That's essentially a 1,000 photographs. A thou yeah. <laughs> Imagine a photograph with a resolution of a thousand iPhone 6s. Crazy levels of resolution. And of course, don't forget, we are a 3D graphics company after all. And you are in one of the most amazing virtual environments you can imagine. And these environments are now so beautiful, technologically so advanced, artistically so beautiful. Why shouldn't you take it in full 360 stereo. Wow. Imagine just with one click, and that click is no longer just print screen. You guys know what I'm talking about. I love this moment, hit print screen. I love this moment, hit print screen. No longer are you constrained to just that. All the freedoms of a di digital camera, all of the special effects, the ability to use Photoshop, and do so much more. The world's first in-game 3D camera systems. Let's take a look at that. Haldor, yeah. where are you? Yep, I'm okay. here. So this game you've probably all seen before. This is The Witness, and it's a beautiful game. And as you're playing it, you'll often get into the situation where you just want to capture the moment, you know, what's on the screen, you want to turn that into a picture. Now in this game, water is actually an obstacle, and for this specific shot, I would like to get actually over the brook. So the way I do that is I enable Ansel, which now allows me to move the camera in any way I want to. So I'm starting here to frame my shot. I'm going to move a little further back. And then I am going to tilt the camera a little bit for dramatic effect. Not too much, though. Just a little bit. And then uh, I'm going to take the shot. But you know, in this case, um, I'm going to crop it. And usually when you crop a, a picture, you're going to lose pixels. And if I just crop this as screen resolution, the end result would be too low resolution. So I'm going to change the capture type to high resolution. And as Jensen mentioned, the high resolution can go really high, as you can see here, 61,000 oh. pixels. <laughs> Before this demo, we're going to leave it at 5x. And that's generating all the pictures. And uh, then those are going to be stitched together. Now, there are more features here, like filters. So let's explore those a little bit. As you can see, I've changed the colors quite a bit here. And um, we can change and add a vignette, for instance. Maybe tone down the brightness a little bit. and. Um, and create exactly the mood that we're looking for, like this. And now if I fix the roll here again, and we go back to just normal 
setting, so it doesn't look like a horror movie anymore. And then you can see the changes that we made. Now we've switched to the other machine so we can show the picture that we just generated. Yes, that's it. And now we're going to crop it. Yep, that's good. And there you go. There's Unbelievable. Art. All right. Now, Holgor, let's let's um, let's let's also show them what what uh, what a three three sixty. Yeah, let's do that. What like. a, yes, exactly. Because you know, like the picture we just took is just, of course, the viewpoint that we saw. But you know, often you have something which you want to share the full environment, the full experience. So let's take this lighter all the way over to three sixty stereo, and generate a full sphere of the environment. And now we can look at that actually on an HMD. If we switch to the Vive display, okay, which is actually ready. So here I am. I'm yeah. holding on to this. Yeah. A one click. Take a stereo 360 photograph, and now I can enjoy it on my head mount display. Wow. Is this amazing? Isn't this fun? Isn't this fun? And you'll get to see, you'll get to see your game like you've never seen it before. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? But you know what? We have an even, even more popular way of enjoying VR. You know that people, the, the, these, these are going to sell like hotcakes, but... Uh, you know that there's uh, there's a lot of people who won't be able to enjoy them with these head mount displays for some time, and so we thought, wouldn't it be great if we made it possible for you to enjoy it on your phone? What? And so, <laughs> yeah. So here we have the same ready? technology integrated into uh, the Witcher. And All right. So, so this is Witcher. Yep. And in the same way. All you way, need is a. Google, excuse me, Holger. Yeah. All you need is a Google Cardboard and any Android phone. You just have to download the NVIDIA app and notice. Okay. Here, you can see it, and that's uh, in the stereo mode. And if you don't have Cardboard and you would just like to fly around that world, what do you think about that? Is that amazing? Look at that. Look at that. This is just thousands of hours of fun. <laughs> we'll just sit there and fly around our virtual game all day long. Share with your friends. Okay? okay. NVIDIA Ansel. The world's first in-game camera system. Now, Ansel is coming to games all over the world. Division, The Witness, Lawbreaker, The Witcher, the next generation, the next version of DLC of, of, uh, of Witcher, Wild Hunt, Paragon, No Man's Sky, Unreal Tournament, and so many more. The developers that we've presented this to are so excited about it because they want you to be able to enjoy the worlds that they've created in all kinds of ways. And now, for the very first time, for people who are in love with in-game photography, um, you can now share it with your game, your, your friends, all in VR. Speaking of VR, speaking of VR, well, VR is about simulating reality. And as you know, reality behaves according to the laws of physics. And in order to allow your game to behave according to the laws of physics, you have to do physics simulation. We're, uh, we're today announcing a major upgrade to our API called VRWorks. We're going to introduce, include physics into VR for the very first time. When you include physics into VR, balls will bounce like balls, fire would burn like fire, smoke would behave like smoke. When you tip something over, it falls, behaving like the behavior according to laws of physics. Water flows like water. That's the benefit of having a physics simulation in real time. And you know that PhysX is the world's first real-time GPU-accelerated physics simulation. By connecting PhysX to your haptics controller 
all of a sudden, you have collision detection, and when you touch something, it vibrates. And so now the world interacts with you with physically-based haptics. Now, one of the grand challenges of audio is geometrically modeled, physically modeled acoustic models. This is something we've been working on for quite some time. We're now today announcing the world's first real-time, physically modeled acoustic simulator. This is based on our engine called Optics. Optics powers our GPU accelerated physically based ray tracer called iRay. And so today, using the same technology, we've been able to bring it to audio processing. Now you know that today's conventional audio basically works, uh, it could be positional, but it's directional. Audio comes, the sound comes directly from that whatever that direction is, but it doesn't interact with the environment that you're in. We know very well that sound propagates through waves, and the waves depend, behave, bounces off, uh, gets absorbed by, gets occluded by the physical structure we're in. Doing that physical simulation, physically based simulation, takes an enormous amount of computation. We created an engine that runs on top of the optics API that runs on top of our GPU. For the very first time, we're able to do this in real time so that we can simulate each one of the environments in an acoustically accurate way. So now when you're moving into a hall in virtual reality, it sounds like a hall. When you walk into a hallway, it sounds like a hallway. When you walk into a stadium, it sounds like a stadium. When you walk into an atrium, where you have hallway on one side and the atrium on the other side, it sounds according to that. The simulation model is all computed in real time. One of our GPUs can compute thousands of these rays, bouncing all around these environments, accumulating it, and turning it into a convolution filter. That filter is then applied to each one of your ears, to the audio stream that you hear, and as a result of that, you hear VR sound. I can't demonstrate it to you guys because you're not in VR. Okay, we are already enjoying reality at the moment. So everything, everything where it occurs, every, uh, that's right, that sucks. We are, did you say it rocks or it sucks? VR, VR works audio, the world's first physically based acoustic simulator engine. Okay, amazing. So amazing graphics, physics simulation, physically based haptics, and physically based acoustic simulation. All of that has been upgraded into VR works. So how do we help you guys enjoy this? Well, what we've done is this. We've created this amazing VR experience we call the NVIDIA VR Funhouse. It's incredibly fun. <laughs> And it's, it's got, it inc includes all of the technology that I just talked about into one singular experience. Things will behave according to physics. Of course, things are beautiful. They're just very, very cute. You can interact with it and connect it to haptics. You can almost feel this world. Let's take a look at the video. You guys have to try that. You can go touch it. <laughs> Tell me that's not fun. Notice the balloon pops, but the amazing thing is the balloon actually moves when you touch it, and when it touches other balloons, it causes other balloons to move. When you pick up a basketball, that basketball, when it touches other basketballs, instead of moving into the basketball, merging into the other basketballs, they actually touch the other basketballs and everything all moves together. Okay? Everything in this world is physically modeled 
everything in this world behaves according to the laws of physics. And as a result, as a result, you're suspended in this virtual world. So the second announcement today is a major upgrade to the NVIDIA VR works to include a whole lot of physics physics simulation technology, and one of the major upgrades is VRWorks Audio, the world's first physically based acoustic engine. <laughs> the production value of games has really increased over the last several years. Partly it's because the video game market is now so big. It's now $100 billion large. And the game developers, competing for your benefit, competing for your business, continues to make games better and better all the time. The production value of games has gone up. But recently, in the last several years, a second factor has really turbocharged it. And that second factor is the fact that all of the game platforms in the world, game consoles and PCs, are now based on one unified architecture, one basic architecture. It is all exactly the same architecture as a PC today. Instead of fragmented architectures, where it's impossible for game developers to overinvest in any single platform, and they have to dedicate a lot of their engineering to porting games over and over again, now they have one single platform they can focus on, one single architecture, essentially, to focus on. As a result, the production value of games has gone up dramatically, and you can really see the difference. The games that we're seeing now, the technology is really quite spectacular. They're just so beautiful. Physically based materials, photogrammetry. Using photogrammetry technology, they're able to essentially take photographs of the world, reconstruct it into 3D, and turn it into a video game. Atmospheric lighting, particle effects, incredibly large worlds, really, really rich geometry, ray trace shadows, soft shadows, high dynamic range lighting. The games are just so beautiful today. Let's take a look at some. So this is the first one. This is Tom Clancy's division from Ubisoft. I mean, I, you would think that you're walking downtown New York. OK, maybe 10 years ago. It's cleaner now. The snow looks like snow. The snow falls like the snow would. The materials are physically based, and that's why they look so realistic. The animation is fantastic. The amount of geometry is just enormous. High dynamic range. You would think you're looking at a photograph. And so imagine, imagine doing Project Ansel, NVIDIA Ansel, on this, and you can capture all kinds of beautiful moments. OK, let's take a look at another game. This is uh, Lara Croft. Lara to all of us. We know her by her friend's first name. This is a Tomb Raider. Physically based modeling of materials. The geometry is so rich, based on photogrammetry. High dynamic, high dynamic range lighting. Volumetric lighting. You can see the, the, the light pierce through the atmosphere. It's just really, really beautiful. Just the ama amazing amounts of detail that we see in games today. Let's take a look at another one. This is Electronic Arts. Mirror's Edge. Look at, look at the way the reflection is working off of the floor. You can really sense, sense the roughness on that floor and the polish, the, I guess the ripples and the polishness of that floor. They're everywhere these days. The lighting is just beautiful. The indirect lighting is amazing. Now you're outdoors, you got high dynamic range. The reflections in this game is particularly amazing. Real-time environmental reflection off of the water. And this is how they do it. Okay? That's terrific. Thank you. So, this, ge this just gives you a small taste of the amazing quality production value of games today. Everything you were looking at just now, everything you were looking at just now, Video game, all of those games were fully maxed out in quality. Every single quality knob was maxed out. And every single game was running over 60 hertz all the time. 
And that's why it looks so beautiful. That's why it's so silky smooth. That's why it brings so much joy to all of us. <laughs> Just makes you smile, doesn't it? Just makes you smile. All of those games were running on the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080. No sweat, nice and easy, everything silky smooth, all so butterily, buttery smooth, so beautiful, just makes you happy. It's hard not to be happy. It's hard not to smile when you look at that. Just brings me enormous amount of pride and joy. Look what my kid can do. So effortlessly just like that. <laughs> well, let me tell you about this chip. This chip is based on a new architecture we've been working on for several years. Several thousand people have been working on this project now for more than two years. This is the largest GPU endeavor, the largest chip project endeavor, the largest processor endeavor in the history of humanity. The R&D budget was several billion dollars. Several billion dollars. I am pretty sure you can go to Mars. I'm pretty sure you can go to Mars. Several billion dollars. The, Pascal packs just so much punch for several reasons. The engineers have just done an amazing job. First of all, the architecture is the most efficient architecture we've ever created. It's the most advanced architecture we've ever created. And I'm going to show you some amazing new technology that you've never seen before. It's the world's first 16 nanometer FinFET GPU in production. World's first. It is also the world's first to use Micron's new G5X memory. This memory is so fast. It is so fast. Well, what you're looking at, that smear in the middle, that smear in the middle, basically are the bits flowing in and out of our chip and to the G5X memory. Each one of those signals, each one of those signals are only 100 picoseconds wide, 100 picoseconds. That's 100 picoseconds is how long it takes light to travel one inch. how long it takes light to travel one inch. In that little bit of time, our engineers have to make sure that data is transferred. Pretty much when you look at this thing on, a, on an oscilloscope, it's pretty much just noise. The fact that you could actually extract information out of this is just unbelievable. G5X, the fastest DDR memory, GDDR memory in the world, the first built by Micron. And the third part, the fourth part, is craftsmanship. Thousands of engineers, thousands of engineers have come up with thousands of ideas over the last several years. And each one of them optimizes on what we already built in the past. Some of them working on break, groundbreaking new technologies. Maxwell, as you know, was already the most energy efficient GPU that's ever been made. And energy efficiency in modern computing is exactly the same as performance. If you're energy efficient, you are also high performance. So energy efficiency is a enormous importance. And so we dedicate ourselves to thousands of small ideas, thousands of small ideas. And the reason for that is because, as you know, Moore's Law is running out of steam. So you can't just take a design and go to the next node, and all of a sudden, you have more performance. We have to do this now through enormous amount of dedication, enormous amount of craftsmanship, thousands and thousands of small ideas, and hundreds of big ones, and a few groundbreaking ones. Well, the craftsmanship of this project of Pascal has been like never before. And then lastly, I want to talk to you about brand new technology. But let me show you a few things first. Craftsmanship. 
I can't show you the thousands of ideas that we worked on, but I selected a couple. And this is how we designed the system around the Pascal GPU. This is the system around the Pascal GPU. Don't forget, when you pull energy out of your wall, it's 120 volts, it's 1,000 watts maximum. However, we take that AC power, we reduce it down to DC, and it's now one volt and nearly 300 amps. And that one volt and 300 amps is being delivered at multi gigahertz. And so the switching power supply design is incredibly hard to do. This is probably one of the most complicated, most artful, most advanced switching power, switching power supply that humanity does today. Well, your goal is this. With the billions of transistors that are switching at a few nanoseconds apiece, our goal is to de deliver essentially a DC power. That DC power can never change. Depending, independent of whether it's Tomb Raider running, or Excel running, or Division running, a big explosion, Minesweeper, minesweeper. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you're running, it has to deliver that clean power. And whenever we, do, we don't deliver clean power, you lose performance, you lose energy efficiency, you lose everything you fought so hard to do. So the delivery of clean power is incredibly important. The white line is the last best in the world. The white line. And basically, that envelope was Maxwell. GTX 980, the world's best GPU. The world's best GPU is the best GPU we've ever built. And that variance is what we were able to achieve with GTX 980. Notice GTX 1080, the variance has reduced dramatically. It's almost essentially a solid line. Out of one, out of one volt, which is all we have to work with, 100 millivolt ripple is all we see. The second, we want to deliver that efficiency, that level of power, that level of current, across the entire operating range of our GPU. Don't forget, these things are running incredibly fast. And it's asked to burst into a level of performance almost instantaneously. Because as soon as you turn around, maybe, maybe you were looking at a nice, quiet, gentle brook, and you turn around, and there are 10 monsters coming your way, and you got to fire back immediately. Well, the amount of graphics processing that changed all of a sudden is instantaneous and enormous. Well, we have to deliver clean power and efficiently as long as we can, all, all throughout that entire, entire experience. And so notice, in the case of GTX 980, our efficiency it was excellent, however, the 1080 took it just another level. Well, what do you get from all of that? Amazing new architecture, 16 nanometer, the world's first 16 nanometer FinFET GPU, the world's first G5X, incredible engineering worksmanship. Well, what you get from that is this. The 1080 is faster than a 980 SLI. Ten eighty is faster than nine eighty SLI, but a ten eighty is way faster than the fastest in the world today. The ten eighty is even faster than a Titan X, and you got to ask yourself, right? How much faster? How much faster? Unbelievable amounts. It is utterly insane. It is insane. The 1080 is insane. It's insane. It's almost irresponsible amounts of performance. When all of it came together, when all of it came together, let's face it, we designed it to do that. We wanted it to do that. We invested billions of dollars so that it could do that. But you still know when the kid graduates and it does something amazing, it still brings you enormous amount of joy. Just so happy. I'm just so happy. Look at that. GTX 1080. It's faster than a Titan X. Not by a little bit, but a whole lot. And with so much less power. Well, basically what this says, not only is 1080 the new king, the Pascal family 
is going to be pretty amazing. So the question is, what are you going to do with all this? Well, the first thing you're going to do with all this is you're going to enjoy every single game on the planet in its full, maximum, tricked out configuration. And you're going to enjoy it nice and silky smooth. And you're going to smile all the time. You're going to have a dumb grin on your face like mine all the time. <laughs> all the time. All the time. But what else can you do? What else can you do? Well, we have a, real, we have a special treat. I, I just I love this man. We've been together. We've been working together now in our industry for a quarter of a century. Few, few have made a greater contribution to the advancement of the technology and the art of video games than this man. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Sweeney. It's great to see you. Now, you don't get an introduction like that every day, brother. Yeah. That's <laughs> Paragon. What is Paragon? I don't know what you. Wait, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't. Are you? A, are you? Are you? Are you one of the early, early adopters, early uh, previewers, game testers of Paragon? All right, you the man. All right. So, so, anyways, um, we could talk about all kinds of stuff. We can spend here. We can. We can talk all night. And, and then tonight, after after this, we will talk all night. I mean, there's so much that's happening in the game industry. I mean, one of the first things, of course. Uh, 25 years ago, when we first started both of our companies, uh, and we were trying to bring uh, revolutionized gaming with PC gaming, uh, there was a lot of technology to, to create. There were, there were a lot of issues in the, in the industry, but we worked through an enormous amount of it. So the, the, the one thing that you and I really, really share and is our belief that the PC gaming platform is an open platform is one of the reasons why innovation happens. You know, could, could you, uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's the openness of the PC platform that's made it uh, the center of innovation for the entire technology in industry for at least 30 years. Um, the GPU revolution um, started right here on PC uh, before uh, DirectX even um, with OpenGL and its predecessor libraries. The VR revolution now is being driven mm -hmm. on PC where the open architecture means that you can combine NVIDIA GPUs and uh, VR headsets from multiple manufacturers together and everything just works. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's an awesome platform, which means that developers from a wide range of industries with a wide range of games and uh, different tastes can all contribute to it in yeah. amazing ways. It's, it's the world's best platform for, for all kinds of gaming, whether it's MMORPG, whether it's first-person shooters, it's going to be the best platform for VR. It's, it's just the best platform for a lot of different things for that very reason, that, that the entire world the smart engineers of the entire world can all contribute to making that platform better. And because it's wide open, it allows all of us to, to innovate at will. Yeah, absolutely. And at every point in history, PC has always had the absolute best graphics hardware available. That's an important point in the progress of the industry. And yep. it improves every year, thanks mm -hmm. to you. Thank you. And so, <laughs> but if, it, if, it's, if, not, if, not for, if not for Unreal Engine, Unreal Engine, all of that horsepower would be in the car and nobody would be able to enjoy it. <laughs> and so, so uh, no, you know, it, it, it is really not an understatement. And I think all of these people in the audience would, would surely agree that, that uh, if not for the Unreal Engine, computer graphics today, uh, gaming graphics today, wouldn't be nearly as beautiful, nearly as advanced as, as it is. Thank you. And so, so Tim, we're here, we're here to talk about, and you, you and I haven't spoken yet, and I'm dying to know what you're going to say. And, and so and we, we just never rehearse. That's our thing. And, and so we ought to just talk on stage. I mean, the, the thing that, that I'm dying to know is what are, you, what are the things that you can do when, when you have graphics performance like a 1080 and um, uh, you have capability like Pascal? What, what are the type of things that we can look forward to in terms of the future of gaming graphics? Well, you know, this new level of performance you're delivering really bridges the gap. You know, historically, there have been two branches of the computer graphics industry. There's been you know, world-class, photorealistic, movie-quality CG um, rendered offline you know, at hours per frame on these you know, very high-end server clusters. And then there's been real-time graphics powering PC gaming. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. we're at the point now where we can ask, can we not have both? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so here, here I'm looking at, at um, something that is a photograph. I mean, it's an amazing photograph 
of of uh, I think this is this is uh, what you guys do with your. Uh, this is a character study. This is how you guys designed the characters of Paragon. Yeah, that's right. You know, Paragon is the new MOBA from Epic Games uh, that combines the classical elements of MOBA gameplay mm -hmm. with very high quality graphics. And as we go about designing new characters, we create these visual prototypes uh, to ask, what is the absolute best visual fidelity we uh, should strive for as a team? Mm -hmm. We do a lot of these experiments. They're often running at one or two or five frames per second. Um, and we ask ourselves, you know, what is possible? And then we strive to achieve that in real time. And this is what this is? This is a character study of something you can do in one or two or five frames per second? And so what are some of the special effects that we're looking at? I mean, how did you guys, this looks amazingly beautiful. What makes it beautiful? Well, we're seeing, seeing a very realistic material model, um, yeah. a physically based material model that simulates the microscopic interactions between light um, and the properties of a material. Mm -hmm. So you get really nuanced appearances to the metal on the character's uh, armor um, and the light transfer through his skin, um, the shading on the hair, uh, and all of these other uh, physically based effects, which we now generate not by just sitting down and winging it, but we actually study real objects in the real world, uh, hair of real people, um, skin. We go out with photogrammatic um, you know, utensils, you know, little light meters, um, and all sorts mm -hmm. of other devices, mm -hmm. and actually measure the real world. Mm -hmm. And then we iteratively improve what we have in the engine until we've actually matched it and mm -hmm. achieved it. So physically based materials we're looking at, the skin shader, um, obviously, our skin has, uh, has, has permeability, so there's this, there's this notion called subsurface scattering. Light comes in, picks up on some of the, the tint of your, of your blood and your flesh, and then it scatters in all kinds of directions, and it gives you that lively look instead of a chalky, chalky cartoony look of, a, of skin. Uh, the, the, the cloth is materially, physically based and, and uh, looks like cloth, and, and the thing that's really, really cool is it's just the, the shiny material looks, looks uh, so real. It just looks so incredibly real. And so this is something that, that today, of course, uh, we can't enjoy uh, in real time. However, however it, sure would be, it sure would be amazing if we can enjoy this someday in real time. Yeah, perhaps someday you can create some GPU technology that will make it possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, guys, I, that, that is, that's a challenge. I think that's a challenge. That's a challenge. And, you know, Tim, Tim, I would like to just tell you that someday has arrived. <laughs> Can we take a look at this, please? Guys, what do you think? Now, I hope you guys realize, I hope you guys realize everything was running in real time. That was not a movie. That was computer graphics generated in real time, courtesy of the amazing team 
that Tim leads at Epic. This is the future of graphics available today. Available today. That's, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, team. Good job, Tim. So amazing. So amazing. Hey, guys, you know, just, just for kicks, just for kicks, let's take a look at some of the clocks. Can we? You guys want to take a look at the clocks? It's up there. Can you guys see it? I know. It's, 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 it's insane. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The GPU is running air-cooled. Air-cooled. The GPU is running at 2.1 gigahertz. That is the fastest clocks of a GPU that has ever been achieved. Water cooled or air cooled, air cooled or water cooled. I think the only, the only faster is a Maxwell GPU immersed in liquid nitrogen. And only barely. And only barely. Because of the amazing craftsmanship, because of the engineering that has been done on this product, its overclockability is just incredible. And look at that. It's running at just a nice, cool as a cucumber, 65 degrees C. 67 degrees C. <laughs> you guys added two degrees to the room. You guys, all of you added two degrees to the room. Incredible. The invention of the GPU is, as, uh, as Tim was saying earlier, the invention of the GPU, the invention of programmable shaders, has taken computer graphics to just an amazing level. The technology is just really quite amazing today. And notice just the amazing beauty that you see. It's so realistic. Tim and I were up here talking just now. And frankly, we believe that in the next couple of years, we're going to leap across the uncanny valley, that it's possible for us now to recreate humanity, recreate human characters in a way that is not only realistic, but utterly attractive. And so this is a, quite, a, quite an amazing time with computer graphics. But there's another revolution that's happening. There's another revolution that's happening. And it's really, really a big deal. Just as we invented programmable shaders and GPUs and it's enabled this level of computer graphics and realism, there's another revolution that's happening as revolution of displays. Resolution of displays is going up. The color depth of displays is going up with high dynamic range. Displays can now be curved. Displays could be put into a dome. There's all kinds of display technology that's happening. HMDs, VR HMDs, and also all kinds of other displays, whether it's lenticular displays, whether it's light field displays, holographic displays. There's all kinds of display revolution that's happening, augmented reality, VR, all kinds of stuff. And what is in common with all of them is the ability, the need to be able to multi-project, to project a particular scene into all kinds of displays, in all, into all of its displays, and to project a particular object into multiple eyes at the same time, into stereoscopic at the same time. The ability to project one scene into multiple monitors is just not the way 3D graphics was designed. The way 3D graphics works today, you have a 3D world, this virtual world, the 3D world, and we see it in a perspective view projected through a viewport that ultimately represents our canvas, our monitor. And so we see a 3D world. It gets projected in a perspective way through a viewport, and we see the object. And we see the object in 3D. But in the final analysis, what you're looking at is a 2D image. It's just a moving 2D image. And that 2D image is so beautiful, and it's behaving in such a realistic way that it appears to be 3D. It's mathematically in 3D. It's projected into a 2D display. Well, this has some limitations because this particular pipeline really can only handle one viewport at a time. And so what we've done is we've introduced, created a whole new part of our system. We call it the simultaneous multi-projection pipeline. Now, what we're doing from now on, our GPUs, will be able to simultaneously project the 3D world through 16 independent viewports that be can be controlled independently. 16 viewports with independent projections from 3D to 2D, and then composite it in a way that you desire, 
so that we can enjoy it in all kinds of interesting display technologies. Okay, so simultaneous multi-projection. Not only is it 16 independent, it could be projected into stereo simultaneously, all in one pass. Now there's an alternative to doing this. There's an alternative to doing this. We can actually render each one of the viewports independently. So that's one, one obvious way of doing it. We could render stereo one at a time and therefore lose half of the performance or require twice the number of GPUs to do so. Okay? And we do, that, we do that on a regular basis today. However, with this new system, whatever is rendered in, in the world can now be projected into 16 independent viewports which can be controlled independently and we can also simultaneously project it into stereo. So the question is, what can we do with that? The question is, what can we do with that? Let's take a look at the first application. So the first application is this. So let me, let me before I show you, this is what, notice, um, this is, you, you see the viewport that's surrounded by the green, green lines, the 3D world, the virtual world, okay, the mathematical three-dimensional world are the 3D objects up on top. And you're looking at it through this viewport and it's transforming it through this viewport in a perspective correct way to the camera, to the camera. This is a virtual camera, and, ideal, and conceptually, that's where you're sitting. Conceptually, that's where you're sitting. And so now you're looking at the world through this viewport, and that world is a 3D world. However, if you would like to, well, let's say, hey, Tom, can we do this? Can we move it around? Let's uh, move that viewport around. Okay, so that basically, that's how it works. You're looking at a viewport. This is the 3D Graphics 101. Okay, 3D Graphics 101. And basically every single GPU today, every single graphic, graphics pipeline today has one of those viewports. And because it makes perfect sense because those view, that viewport is basically our screen. Okay, now one of the things we like to do is we like to have a much larger field view. We want to see a lot more. Okay, and so we buy a couple more monitors and we have multi-monitors and we now connect it into this view. Now you sit in this multi-monitor. Now the, mon the monitors, people who like to do this also enjoy large monitors. And so now you have a 32 inch monitor, three of them, and pretty soon uh, when you want to look left, you gotta look over there. Uh, you gotta look right, you gotta look over there. And um, you can't see both sides of it. And, and the monitor spans basically your entire bedroom. <laughs> and it's kinda not the point. What you really want to do, what you really want to do, is you want to have essentially a virtual surround system. You want to be able to have the graphics, the world, wrap around you. And so let's do that, Tom. Let's wrap the, the displays around you. Now, notice now the displays are now wrapped around you. However, don't forget, the original perspective correct projection was done with the monitors that were flat. And now that you've warped the monitors around you, that monitor, the, the, the image that's projected on it, is now wrong. Is now wrong. And that's why when you guys enjoy World of Warcraft in that amazing 3, 4K display, and you see your entire kingdom right in front of you, right? When you wrap that display around you, it looks warped. When you're driving a virtual uh, driving simulator or you're racing and you have surround displays, all of the cars that go by are kind of distorted somehow, and it just looks terrible. Okay, the only thing that you're getting out of it is you're getting that, if you will, blur in your peripheral vision, and you get the sensation that you're in that world. However, everything is actually wrong in the two other displays. And so there's an answer for that, using multi-projection technology, because we can project into each one of those viewports independently, with independent projections, we can make it look right, okay? Now, there's a solution for this today. Just buy three graphics cards. <laughs> and in fact, that's what people do. You can buy three graphics cards, and if you can get the game, if you can get the game to project it into, into each one of those displays correctly, you will have surround, surround, uh, surround view. However, with GTX 1080, with Pascal, we can now do one single pass into three 
independent projections, and now you get surround graphics, surround view, for free. And I can't imagine a better price than free. <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay? So, one benefit of multi-projection. Independent viewport projections, all done simultaneously, no performance degradation. Well, let's see this in action. Okay. Well, well Jensen, the best way to really take a look at this is to take a, a look at it in an application. So, what you're looking at here is a, a monitor that we've got in the back here. And it's, it's exactly the traditional way you'd see the game on a single monitor. But uh, Sean, if you can rotate to the right, <clears throat> slowly pan to the right. What you're seeing here, go ahead and stop right there. A little bit further to the right, sorry. This is the way games look today. And uh, Jensen, what you can see is on the floor, there's that very clear So can I, sh can I show you guys? Just stop for a second, Sean. So, so Tom, stop for a second, OK? Sure. Can I just show you? You see, you see this right here? That right there, that looks wiki wonky. That's a technical term for that's wrong. That's a technical term for that's wrong. That is clearly wiki wonky. Okay, now, now the way to solve that, the way to solve that, of course, this was originally, remember, this was originally projected into three panels that were all planar. And so the original projection is actually correct. And if you sat in the middle of that projection and you look out to that far corner, it actually looks correct. And it actually is correct. However, when you now bend the monitors inward so you can actually see it, so that you can actually see it, it the projection is no longer correct. And so, Tom, could you do this? Can you correct it? Absolutely. So, Sean, give me some correction. Dang, right. look at that. <laughs> look at that. Okay, so, so, what you're, so what you're now seeing, what you're now seeing is essentially out the window. It's almost like you're looking out a window. And this particular window is a, a display next to you. And let's go to, Tom, could you, can you swipe me to the other side? Yeah, absolutely. Sean, rotate the camera slowly to the left. And let's take a look at the gigantic virtual window into this world. It, it actually dramatically increases your field of view. And you're, it's like you're in this plaza somewhere in Italy, right? It's, it's really just fantastic. And notice the tables aren't warped, the chairs aren't warped. Well, let's, let's uh, go back to the way it was. Okay, turn it off, Sean. So that's oh, no. Yeah. Uh, it's painful. It's painful. Oh, no. Please give Boy. me simultaneous multi-projection. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, thank, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sean. You got it. So let's go back to Can the... Can I? I'm sorry, go ahead, Sean. Justin, sorry. You want to do this? I, I'm ready. Okay, no, it's Ready. just... <laughs> it's hot. Um, it's in hot, though. Yeah. I don't know. How do you feel? <laughs> Tom, we talked earlier, remember? <laughs> it's pretty exciting, though. I, I, I get a little goosebumpy when I look at it. <laughs> Is this on the internet? <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, so, so Tom, Jason, Tom, I, know what you, you, I know you know what you're looking at. Tom. Yeah. Fish, is it me or, or is it? Can I, can I just, Tom? Yeah. Could I do this for a second? Yep. May I just finish? Whoa. Got him. Absolutely. All right, all right, thank you. All right. So, so, <laughs> where, where, what is this? What, what, what do we have? Can, can we go back to the original slide, please, Tom? Please. The original slide. The way, the way. Go back to the slide. The slide. Um, okay. So now we have, we have. Uh, Tom, you do it. What's that? Okay. So uh, let me just explain what I, th I think we're looking at here. This is VR, and in VR, uh, you actually have. Tom, I was being sarcastic. Oh. <laughs> I wish I could see your face. I, I bet it's not happy. <laughs> Guys, okay, I'll be going. right back. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Yeah.
No, no, he's, the, my, he's my best guy. You should see some of the other guys. Okay, so can, can I, so, so we saw, we saw multi-projection into three displays. And the fact that we could, we could display uh, into those, project into the three, three displays, three viewports, and be able to independently control them allows us to fix the warp, the distortion that otherwise would have existed. There are other, other ways that we could use simultaneous multi-projection. So for example, if we're in, in, um, in VR, okay, can we, if we can just go to the VR but don't do anything. Please, Tom, if we can go to the VR configuration, but please don't do anything. No, not, well, how is this? Without the lens, there you go. I'll let you know when it's the next thing to do, okay? Absolutely. All right, thank you. All right, and so I'll pay you double. Sweet. I'm in. I'll give you whatever you want. <laughs> Just let me finish my job. Before DreamHack actually starts. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is using multi-projection. Multi-projection of the same world now into two eyes. Into two eyes. Okay? Now, when you're seeing something in stereo, of course, you see two different projections. Now, why, why this is really valuable. Now, before, we, before I tell you why this is really valuable for, for us to do the independent viewport control, the way that you enjoy VR is you put a lens, because your eyes are so close to the display, you can't focus on it. And so you put a lens in front of it, you put a little lens, it's like a magnifying glass, and now you can enjoy the display that's literally an inch away from your eyes, and you could look at that display. However, as you know, all lenses have distortion. All lenses have distortion. And so let's go ahead and put the lenses in. And so what you... I was hoping to see distortion. Tom and I didn't rehearse this, which, which, which I think is apparent, <laughs> which is apparent. And so what you should see, what you should see is this. You have, you're projected into the beginning, the front of the lens, and when it comes out of the back of the lens, it's now distorted. And the way that we solve that problem is we pre-distort, we pre-distort the image. We stretch it out all really far on the edges. We pre-distort the image. Then now when it goes into the lens, when you look at it, it actually looks right. The problem with that, the problem with that is that because we rendered all these stretched out pixels that we are never going to show, you never see it, we rendered it for nothing. We wasted a whole lot of performance. And you know that it is so difficult to achieve performance at all in the first place with VR. We're trying to achieve 90 frames per second, and it's so difficult to do so. And so as a result, we can't afford to waste any pixels. The way we solve that problem is this. Instead of those two projections that you see, we turn those two projections into four projections per eye. Into four projections per eye. Then we orient those four projections in such a way, we orient those four projections in such a way, such that the image is distorted properly coming in. And we don't have to stretch it all out. We don't have to stretch it all out. So we, sh we distort effectively the viewport transform. We distort Sorry. the viewport transform. And now that it goes through the lens, it comes out on the other end. Sorry. It comes, it's. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry. It's coming in hot. We're <laughs> we still love you, Tom. There you go. We still love you. We still love you. <laughs> and so now notice what's actually happening. The, the two viewports, the two projections, are now broken up into four projections each. And each one of the four projections are configured to be lens matched. We call that a lens match shading. And so as a result, the, four, the two projections became eight projections, but they're all single pass anyhow. And they're configured so that it distorts the image properly. And now we render and shade and process each one of the pixels in the most conservative possible way. No waste whatsoever.
to waste as little processing as, po as possible. The flip side of not wasting, the flip side of not wasting is you get a huge boost in performance. You get a huge boost in performance. And so it just depends on which, what, what, uh, what experience we're talking about. It could be 40, 50, 60% boost in performance. And so here you are, you have, t you have GeForce GTX 1080. That's already way faster than a Titan X. And then now you get multi-projection through your stereo. And you get a huge boost on top of that. You get a huge boost on top of that. Well, as I mentioned earlier, not only do we get multi-projection on 16 different viewports, all configured independently, all in one pass, all done in the, in the pipeline, we can also project to both eyes in stereo in one pass. We can also project in one pass. And so let's take a look at the implication of that. And so now you're, you're looking at a, at a particular experience. This is VR experience. And this is a very, very, very lovable monster. It has, it has an enormous amount of geometry complexity. The more geometry you have, of course, the richer the character looks. The more geometry you have, the more lighting you have to do, the more shadowing you have to do. And so the amount of processing is actually quite significant. You know, remember, you're running this on a 1080. This is now the fastest GPU in the world. You're running on a 1080. And now, it's, as you can see, there's a little bit of stuttering. Let's take a look at the frame rate counter, please. This is on a 1080 running about 60, 70 frames per second. Now, 60, 70 frames per second is really, really fantastic, but not in VR. When you're in VR and you're, you want to see everything in 90 frames per second, 90 frames per second so it's silky smooth, so that the latency is as short as possible, any stuttering really gives you a little bit, you know, kicks you out of, out of that, that sensation of, of virtual presence. And so you really can't afford to have any stuttering. Now, let's turn on single pass stereo. Let's just enjoy this monster. <laughs> Let's <laughs> Let's just enjoy the presence of this monster. She's so beautiful. Could be a he, could be a she. No, I would not call this Tom. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tom, I'm not doing this. This is the audience. It's the audience. 96 frames per second, single pass stereo, unbelievable. All of this because of multi-projection. Ladies and gentlemen, some simultaneous multi-projection. <laughs> All kinds of interesting displays coming out. The revolution of programmable shading brought computer graphics to where it is today. But the next generation of computer graphics is really being immersed in the environment. It's really about being able to take computer graphics and put it into the physical world. So we're going to see amazing holographic displays. All of those display technology requires a brand new way to project 3D into our eyes. Multi-projection, simultaneous multi-projection. Pascal. Brand new technology, a brand new type of graphics pipeline for computer graphics. I'm super excited about it. Now, when you compare that, when you put all that stuff together, 1080, Pascal, the amazing craftsmanship, and simultaneous multi projection, GTX 1080 is twice the perf and three times the energy efficiency Damn. versus a Titan X. Damn. Twice the performance of a Titan X, three times the energy efficiency, and crazy amounts of overclockability. Just crazy. That is the GTX 1080. We're so proud of it. I'm so proud of all the engineers that have made it possible. We made a small video for you. Let's run it.
Ladies and gentlemen, the new king, GTX 1080. Unbelievable. Twice the performance of Titan X, three times the energy efficiency. Need the clicker. <laughs> Everything's going so smoothly tonight, everybody. <laughs> Unbelievable. Twice the performance of a Titan X, our $1,000 flagship product today. 1080 is twice the performance and three times the energy efficiency. Ladies and gentlemen, the GTX 1080. Nine teraflops, eight gigabytes of G5X, the world's first G5X memory from Micron, $599 MSRP. The NVIDIA designed Founders Edition 699 gives you crazy overclockability, amazingly beautiful design. I hope you love it. Twice the performance of Titan X and three times the energy efficiency. General availability around the world, May 27th. But I have more. Yes. What? Yes. What? What is it? GTX 1070. 6.5 teraflops, 8 gigabytes of G5 memory, faster than a Titan X, faster than a Titan X, $379 MSRP. And for the NVIDIA designed Founders Edition, 449, available all over the world, June 10th. The best, best GPU architecture we have ever created, the best GPUs we have ever designed. This is really, really a special moment. So that's it. We talked about four things today. Our mission, our mission is to build computing technologies for the most demanding users in the world. For gamers, for designers, for artists, for scientists, for dream hackers. Today, we're so happy to take it to the next level. This is the work of several thousand engineers, almost three years, billions of dollars of R&D, and we announced four things. The world's first in-game camera system. Do you guys love it? Yeah. NVIDIA Ansel. A major upgrade to VR works. Major upgrade to VR works, including physics, including physics-based haptics, and very importantly, the world's first real-time, physically modeled acoustic simulation engine, VRWorks Audio. The second announcement, VRWorks major update. And so that we can all celebrate and enjoy it, we've created a VR experience. It's gonna be available on Steam, and we're gonna, as soon as we uh, release it, we're also going to open source it so that we can all make it amazing. Third, a brand new generation of GPUs. A new generation of architecture, Pascal, the best that we have ever made, the best GPUs we've ever designed. Today we're announcing the 1080 and the GTX 1070. And lastly, a brand new revolutionary graphics technology called simultaneous multi-projection. Allows us to take graphics into all kinds of cool new display technologies so that we can enjoy it, whether it's in surround with the correct perspective projection or with incredible performance in VR. And there are so many more new 
projector technologies and display technologies coming. Pascal is going to be ready for all of that. So that's it, everybody. Have a nice night. Welcome to DreamHack.